Today we're going we're gonna to follow up a little bit on, on last week's service, on Pastor Celine and Pastor Shelley's message. Uh, it's still part of this theme of stand. To stand and speak to make a difference. Matthew 3, excuse me, Matthew 5, verse 13 and 14. In the New King James it says, You are the salt of the earth. Then, he, then Jesus goes on, and He says, you're the light of the world. Every, everybody knows Jesus is the light of the world. But Jesus stood on that hillside in Judea 2,000 years ago, and He pointed at the people. He pointed His finger at the people. He said, no, no, you, you are going to be the salt. You are going to be the light of this world. The Message Bible says it this way. Let me tell you why you are here. So many people are looking for their purpose in life. So many people are asking, why am I here? Why am I there? Why am I doing this? Jesus made it really clear here. Let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be the salt seasoning that brings, brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? We are going to be the interference for people to miss out on the taste of godliness. Liz Jones made a statement the other day. I really loved it. She said, if they can't see Jesus, it's because we ain't showing Jesus. Why are you here? Did I butcher that adequately? You said it so much more articulately. I know. It's hard to get good help around here, isn't it? <laughs> Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors of the world. Who's here to be the light for the God colors? You are. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill, like Miwok Village. Or quoting from one of my new favorite translations, the Hawaiian Pigeon version. It's a real version. It's a real translation. Wycliffe did it in 2000, the year 2000. You can get it. You can get it in Bible Gateway. You can buy it. But this is great. You guys know how the food needs salt for stay good. Some same thing. The people all over the world need you guys. The people all over the world need you guys. What guys? You. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for inviting us to be a part of those guys. Thank you for calling us, for putting your life in us so that we can represent you and be the salt of this earth and the light of the world. Father, tonight, today for the next few minutes, Lord, help me to express what you want said today. Open our understanding, open our hearts to hear, and most importantly, Lord, to respond to what you want said and what you want done. We thank you for the privilege, for the honor to be counted part of your family and part of what you're doing on this earth. Help us, Lord. Go before us, we pray in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I got a newsletter a week ago Friday, August the 30th, from Pacific Justice Institute. Anybody know who Pacific Justice Institute is? It's a, it's a legal missionary group set up and run by, by attorneys, and they represent Christian principles in government and in our culture. They're founded in Sacramento by Brad Dacus, still the president. They have offices now in, in Sacramento, well, Sacramento, San Francisco, L.A., I think Seattle, they have been main players in what's been going on in this battle of the cultures for 10 or 15 years now, maybe 20. They represented the Proposition 8 team in, uh, the, in, uh, 10 years ago at the Supreme Court. So they're, they're very active, doing great work. We support them. Your church, your tithe dollars help support them. This was this, this newsletter, and it's about Assembly Bill 2943. Quote, in a surprising move, a California legislator announced that he is dropping his efforts 
to have certain types of LGBT-related counseling be declared fraudulent or deceptive. He's dropping his efforts to have them called fraudulent or deceptive. Going on, Assembly member Evan Lowe released a statement on his website to announce that after meeting with numerous religious leaders who were concerned about the bill, he will rework the legislation for future legislative session. Today is the last day, that was a week ago Friday, the 30th of August, today is the last day of the year for the legislature to give final approval to bills to be able to be sent to the governor for signature. Going on, he says, through the process, the legislature heard from Pacific Justice Institute and countless others explaining the bill's unconstitutionality. Among other things, the bill called into question whether core religious doctrines such as sin, repentance, spiritual transformation would be deemed as fraudulent in the counseling context by our state. The legislation declared that same-sex attraction and same-sex sexual orientation are normal and any efforts to change them are deemed deceptive and fraudulent. Going on, earlier this summer, in a case in which the P PJI was involved, the U.S. Supreme Court disapproved the leading precedent from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals on which AB 2943 relied. In other words, this previous thing was a precedential upon which this bill was relying. And the PJI representing in the Supreme Court overturned it. Going on, Brad Dacus, president of PJI, com commented, we are immensely relieved that this latest threat to religious freedom in California has been taken away for at least this year. This should be a great encouragement to the faith community in California that active engagement with lawmakers can still make a difference. We will continue to be vigilant in battling similar legislation to ensure that the First Amendment remains robust. Going on, he says, some legislators express that they receive more calls about AB 2943 than any other bill in the legislature this year. Some staffers stated that they had never seen anything like the hundreds of people who came to committee hearings at the Capitol to speak against the bill. Our involvement makes a difference. We love all people. Jesus came and died on the cross because He so loved the entire world. All humans. All humans. My sins are no worse than anybody else's. And my past was way more colorful than most. But the Word of God is still true. And we live in a country that was founded on the principles of the Word of God. And one of those is called the First Amendment that says we have the right to live in a country free to, to live, to worship, and to teach what we see the Bible teach. So I'm not telling what other people can or have to believe. I just want to be free to believe and preach and teach what the Bible says. So we, our arms are stretched out to all people, all Californians, all Americans. We're only asking that you stretch your arms out to us as well. And I'm here to say it's making a difference. Your prayers and our involvement is making a difference. And we need to step it up. I need to step it up. I need to step it up and be more involved. I need to not say, well, we're in California. What's the use? Even in California, it makes a difference. So this Tuesday, day after tomorrow, Pastor Dennis Ortman of Chapel of the Pines and myself, we are driving to San Jose, and we're going to listen to, uh, uh, to the president, Brad Dacus, president of BJI. We're going to be involved with an event there in San Jose. We're going to continue as long as we have a voice. We're going to stand, and we're going to speak, and we're going to believe God that that voice will make a difference. Does anybody agree? Yeah. 
A famous quote from a Lutheran theologian right after World War II who suffered through a prison camp in Nazi Germany. His name is Martin Niemöller. He said, first they came for the socialists. I did not speak out because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. I did not speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. We're not going to stand and be guilty of that. We're going to stand and make a difference. In love, it's not violence, it's love. And we're going to continue to speak the love of Jesus and speak of the redeeming factors of Jesus and the life-changing power of Jesus. We're going to bring the best hope the world ever will ever have, Jesus. And we're going to continue to be a voice for those who want it. If they don't want it, that's okay. We love them anyway. Does everybody agree with that? This is... This is still about what happened last Sunday. Anybody enjoy Pastor Celine and Pastor Shelley speaking? Huh? I love it when they preach. I, I want to see them preaching more. But I want to talk even more. I want to continue on in this vein. The church is God's plan. Does anybody agree with that? It's not a side idea. It's not just some method in His madness. The church is God's plan. The church is the body of Christ. The church is His feet on the earth. It's the point of contact that heaven has on earth. It's the site of the embassy of heaven, and you're the ambassadors. The church is the apple of His eye. Anybody know what that means? It's an old King James uh, illustration. It means the pupil of your eye. To what de degrees do you go to protect your eye? That's how important and valuable the church is to the God who created the heavens and the earth. The church is the love of His life. Jesus gave His life for the church to redeem her back to Himself. The church is the agency of His authority on this earth. We're the eviction agents. We're here to evict Satan the illegal occupant of this planet. And that's our job. The church is the place where transformation is happening to the sons and daughters of God, for the sons of, and daughters of God, to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. So that Jesus isn't alone as the one manifesting the life and glory of God. But all the rest of His brothers and sisters are. The church is the place of transformation through the sons and daughters to our neighbors and to our community around us. They're not seeing Jesus because we're not showing Jesus. And like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 and Romans, the body of Christ is very complex. One body, many members. And every single member is valuable and important. If you don't believe that, take your pinky finger and a hammer and slam it and see what your body does in response to the damage to this unimportant member of your body, right? Nobody who's willing to take, take me up on that? Oh, you're willing to hit my finger, right? Yeah, okay. Keep your high heel shoes on, girls. And yet, so few of the members of the body get recognition. It's all about the pastor. It's all about the choir. It's all about the worship leader. That's not the way it was designed. That's why I love this idea of spotlight. Kudos to John, to Liz, and Brooke, wherever Brooke's wandering at. Now, where's Brooke? She's around here. There she is. It was their idea to do this spotlight where several times a year we're going to take the opportunity to, spot, to, to point the spotlight on the many min, ministries that are going... What does minister mean? Servant and? Slave. That's right. And so if, if minister means servant or slave, then what is ministry? 
It's the activities of the slave. The activity of the, the servant, right? And that's what's happening. And, and they're the ones who keep the church going. And I'm not just talking about keeping their snorkel in the air. Not just treading water. Just keeping the doors open, the lights on, and the toilets working. But these ministries, all these servants, including the chief slaves, we're making a difference. We're not just keeping the doors open. We're making forward progress. We're making a difference in our church, in our kids' lives, in our community, in our state. It's the, it's the ministries that are doing it. And every single ministry is of value. Last week, we focused the spotlight on, on who? On what part of our ministry? Samuel Company. That's right. And Peniel's back now, so we can give her some credit, huh? That was terrible. Come on, everybody, put your hands together for Peniel Will. This is a huge ministry, making a huge impact on this world and the lives of so many people. It, it's not new. Betty Owen, I believe, was the first one in charge of the junior church back then, right? And it has shifted into so many faithful hands. Lynette Barrett, Cindy Kirk, Eileen Ballou. I mean, I should never have started mentioning names because I'm going to hurt somebody's feeling for not hearing them. But, but just stop right there, right? Okay, how about this? Pinelle and her team. Pinelle and her team. They're making a difference. I mean, I love the testimonies that continue to, to surface. I love, well, Kim Garrow's not here today, but Kim was here at the age of 11 to 13. I think that was 25 years ago, right? Yeah, okay. You're my witness, that's what I said. But all sincerity, she was here, her parents were a part of the rest of us who came all messed up from the chest up and, and all drugged out and screwed up. And, and she was here, their family was here for like maybe two and a half, three years. And her experience with junior church, she will say to this day, were the two or three only happy years in her childhood. And it was what junior church did in their life. It makes a huge difference. The lives of these people are growing up, being raised in the things and the purposes of God. And it's happening still today. They're doing a fabulous job. Would you agree? Yeah. And we're going to, over the course of the year, we're going to uh, have many of these uh, times of spotlight on these unsung heroes and ministries that make a difference in this church. But, but last week, I just got to take a few more minutes about this, about this Samuel Company thing. Last week, we heard from a young man. How, how old is Samuel? Ten? How old's... He'll be what? He'll be ten next month. We heard a word from this young man. It was more than just, uh, let's show what junior church is teaching the kids. Yeah, he was cute, right? But he was more than just cute. Yeah, he was a pride and joy of a very proud pair, set of parents and, and grandpa and grandma. But that kid spoke a rhema word. He spoke a pressing, timely word. He spoke a word which is the front lines, the battle line for the church in America today. Do you remember the word? Pursuing God with commitment and determination. That is why America's church is collapsing today because people do not know how to pursue God with commitment and determination. And that young man, that 10-year-old, got up and spoke it. I'm here to tell you, this, is a, this was a testimony, that these kids are more than just learning about God. There's been a vision in the hearts of these leaders for these kids to do more than, than memorize Scriptures, more than just get a touch from God. They have a vision to see these kids hear the voice of God, speak the voice of God, 
and touch others. Not just be touched, touch others. And they, they are meeting and exceeding the expectations. They are overworked, they are underappreciated and undersupported. They need your help. No, not everybody can get up and be a part of Junior Church. But we need your help. We need you to be a part. First and foremost, I like the way Jez said it, the most important thing you can do is pray for those kids and pray for those teachers. Get the sticky note out, put it on your bathroom mirror, pray for Sam Co. Pray for the kids. Support them. We need this. We need your help. Make sure to go to, I mean, every Sunday, we go over to the fellowship hall. Go to some of these kids. Encourage them. Go to Samuel. Tell him what a great job he did. Go to the teachers. Thank them. Support them. Is there anything you can do? If there is, go talk to Pinyell. She'll tell you. She, you can help organize the cur- curriculum in the file folders. I mean, there's a lot of things we can do. And many hands make small work. Let's all pitch in. This is a great ministry. It's making a difference in the lives of this church, the lives of your community, in the lives of your nation. It's going to make the difference. You know, there are a lot of voices speaking to our kids. Our five-year-olds through 17-year-old children, for the next nine months, they're going to spend four to six, maybe seven hours a day in schools. They're going to be taught by teachers. They're going to be spoken to by people who run these government institutions of education. Now let me take a minute. I've said it before. I want to say it again. In Tuolumne County, we have a very unique opportunity. We have an extremely high ratio of the educators and administrators and political uh, leaders in our, country, in our county here that are believers. And they stand for the principles of the Bible. We are extremely blessed. In our own church, we have teachers and administrators. This is fabulous. But unfortunately, they're still in the minority. And most of these teachers, most of these administrators, and I'm just not leaving it to school. What about all the stuff they see in the media, whether it's their phones or their computers or their televisions? They're not being taught the Bible. They're being indoctrinated into principles that are opposite what you believe. In fact, they believe that your philosophies are errant and aberrant. That you're wrong. Many of them believe that your perspectives are, like I said earlier, fraudulent and deceptive. They literally want to make it illegal. They are trying to change our kids and their perspectives. They are speaking to our kids every day. We must speak to our kids every day. We must begin in a new earnest effort to teach our kids the rights from the wrong. Teach them what the Bible says. We must stand behind the teachers, the men and women, the Mark Welties, the Julie Battles, the people who are dedicating their lives to teach our kids and do so in a manner that propagates the gospel of the kingdom. Mark needs to know that you appreciate what he does. He needs to hear it from you. Because every day, he's in that other side of the fence. Mark, thank you. Come on, everybody. Thank you, Mark. (laughs) Who's going to teach our kids? First, of course, it's primarily up to the parents. But we're a body of Christ. We can work together. We can see our parents' hands lifted. We can encourage them. We can come alongside. And we get to have the kids at junior church. And we get to share with them, teach them to hear the voice of God, to stand and to speak the voice of God. Who's going to teach them? 
we must. Celine mentioned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego last week. These were not just children of a captive nation. Bible scholars aren't certain as to how old they were, but most agree that they were teenagers, probably young teenagers. And these young teenagers, most of them were likely to be victims and witnesses of some of the most brutal abuse and torture and, and behavior of wickedness that a human can do on a human. I'm not going to go into more detail, but if you know anything about the history in those days, it was brutal beyond imagination. We have troubled kids today in our culture. We have kids who are abused. The vast majority of them don't even imagine the degree of brutality that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego suffered by the time they were 14 or 15. And yet, in that condition, they were willing, they were able to be able to stand up for their convictions, the principles of right and wrong that they were taught by their parents and by their culture. There was a war going on then as there is today. And the conflict was about what? It was about worship. Who are you going to worship? In chapter 3, in chapter 3, this is about, uh, they're already, by this time, they're adults. By this point in time, they've literally been appointed to be prime ministers of one of the, one of the, the major provinces of this nation, the province of Babylon. And the, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, he decrees that everybody's going to worship his God. He set up a 70-foot-tall gold statue. And whenever music is played, everybody stops what they're doing, bows on their knees, and worships this, this statue. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused. And then some of their enemies brought it to the king. Chapter 3, verse 12, it says, they're speaking to King Nebuchadnezzar. There are some Jews, namely Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods. And they do not worship the statue you set up. The Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage, it says. And he ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they came in, he said, Is it true that you refuse to serve my gods and to bow down to my statue that I set up? He says, I'm going to give you one more chance. I'm going to give you one more chance to bow down and worship this statue when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse then you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. So, tell me now what God will be able to rescue you from my power. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I personally believe they were not disrespectful. He started out by saying, O Nebuchadnezzar, Your Majesty, we do not need to defend ourselves. The King James Version says, we are not careful in our response to your question. We do not need to defend ourselves. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, then the God whom we serve is able to save us. There are three levels of faith that they're raising in this thing. Number one, these men declared that their God is able to save them from Nebuchadnezzar. How many of our kids would be able to embrace and state that degree of faith? When they are faced with this trial, when they're being told that they've got to worship the way the world wants them to worship, or they're going to suffer great loss, possibly their life, how many of our kids would stand up and say, I ain't going to defend myself. My God is able. Number two, he says, not only is my God able to save us, but number two, he will rescue us from your power. Not just able, but they are predicting that God will. And then number three is probably the most gripping, the most gripping level of faith. He said, but even if he doesn't, 
even if he doesn't. He's able and he will. But even if he doesn't rescue us, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. We will never. How many of our kids would have the courage, the knowledge, the faith to those three things? How many of we parents would have the courage and the faith to say that God is able, God will, and even if He doesn't heal me the way I think He should heal me, or prosper me the way I think He should prosper me, or give me the spouse, the husband, the wife, the ministry, the house, whatever we think God could, should, or would give us, even if He doesn't, I'm not serving your gods. I'm not bowing down to your idols. How many of us have that strength? And I, I'm going I'm to dive into this a little bit more maybe next week or the next. Because we're living in a time where that kind of faith is going to be called on. Where we're going to have to see God as more than Jehovah Santa that gives us our gifts because we've been good boys and girls. God's calling on a people who are going to stand for Him for what's eternally right, even if He doesn't give it to us the way we think He should or would. But today, I want to continue to talk about this opportunity with our kids. Who will teach our kids these principles? Who will stand for them? Who will make a difference for them so that they can make a difference in this world and in this time? You know, there are, there are pressures that we went through as kids. And man, they were tough, weren't they? They were tough, weren't they? Yeah. The pressures and the struggles our kids have today are that on steroids. The pressures they have on them, the, the pressures to do the wrong thing make ours look simple and easy. The sexual explosion they're involved with today. I mean, kids have smartphones at what age now? And guess what's available on smartphones? I mean, I don't want to go into the details. I don't need to tell you the details. Our kids are facing stuff we never did. Drug abuse, substance abuse, way worse than it was when we were. Pornography? This thing is rampant and out of control. I don't know if you're aware, Time Magazine had a cover article this year about the effects of 20 years of uncontrolled pornography on the men of America. It, they say that science has shown that it rewires their brain. They're no longer able to think the way men should and the way men are supposed to. This is what our kids are facing. They need you. They need me. They need all of us. Together, we can make a difference. But we got to go beyond shouting about it in church. If you don't know how you can help, we have ideas. You don't have to take on the junior church ministry, but it would sure help if you gave them a little of your time. You don't have to go be a teacher, but I'm sure that your teachers here in town would love to have them know that they have your support. There is things we can do. There are resources available. Make them yours. Pacific Justice Institute prints out every, it was just last week, a whole list of resources of where you can get um, all these different things which will show you what your rights are as, an, as a parent. How you can opt out of sex education. You can, dis, you can declare your kid's right for privacy in the schools. There's so many things we can do. Are we doing them? Is this the role of the church? Is this the role of the believer? Are we sticking our nose where it doesn't belong? I believe we're starting to be stirred to do exactly what we're supposed to do so we can make a difference for our kids, the ones that are ours, related to us, but the ones in our culture. So today, I'm going to close it. We're, we've run out of time. But I just want to challenge Word of Life Fellowship. 
Whatever you can do, do it. Whatever you can do, do it. Start with a sticky note on your mirror. Start with talking with John Foley, charge of our volunteer system. Talk with Piniel. They can use your help. An hour a month, they can use an hour a month of your time. They can use 30 minutes a month of your time. Let's make a difference. We've got 60 kids over there whose lives are in our hands. Let's do a great job. Let's do a great job. Amen? Thank you.